On this edition of Awaken the Wonder, my guest had an incurable STD disease. Now he's the author of seven books, is married, has kids that are all doing wonderful, and he never was supposed to have them. Stay tuned, next. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Awaken the Wonder. Right off the top here, I just want to remind you to subscribe. Make sure you share this video wherever you are and make sure you follow us on our social media channels. You can do that at Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at Evangelist Caleb Wampler. Today I have a guest in the studio who we're going to meet in just a moment, Michael Dow. This man is a man on fire with the power of the Holy Spirit. He, was, he has an incredible testimony that you're about to hear in just a moment. But before we get to that, Come with me to the nation of Pakistan, where an amazing miracle took place for a gentleman. He had a tumor in his stomach and was amazingly healed by the power of Jesus Christ. Look at his story next. This is evangelist Caleb Wampler coming to you from the great nation of Pakistan. This week we've been ministering in gospel crusades all around the nation and right now I'm actually on my way to an orphanage at this orphanage we're going to be ministering to the children all around and it's been absolutely amazing because in the large gospel campaigns and in the little gospel campaigns we've done this week we have seen wonderful miracles take place one of the amazing miracles actually happened in an area where persecuted Christians have been pushed far off the beaten path in this area and they were over in this area without much electricity and there was a man there that came up and walked up onto the platform after we prayed for the sick and he began to put my hand on his stomach. I didn't know what was going on at first as I was trying to ask questions and through the language barriers, eventually the interpreter was able to tell me that this man had been having a tumor in his stomach that was quite large for over two decades. He was excitedly putting my hand on his stomach and eventually I understood why. He was putting it there because the tumor was gone. His, his belly felt completely normal and it was absolutely wonderful as he rejoiced at the miracle God had done for him. May God do a miracle for you just the same and may he heal you today. God bless you here from Pakistan. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed that miracle. Man, this is what God is doing in the nations. He is a God that loves you, that today wants to encounter you. And no matter which country, no matter where you are, no matter if you're in a car or in a living room, it does not matter. God wants to encounter you today with his power, with his love, and he can touch you right where you are today. Today, my guests and I, we're going to pray for you guys at the end of the program. And we're believing that God is going to touch you powerfully. But right off the back, I want to uh, welcome my friend, Michael Dow. Welcome, man. I bless you, bro. I'm now, honored to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you, man. Um, you're, you're based right here in the Orlando area with me here in Florida, for those that don't know where Orlando is. And um, we got to meet during um, my time at Christ for All Nations. I was there serving as an assistant uh, to Daniel Kalenda. And through that time, uh, you were already in the ministry, but you were uh, doing the apprenticeship program at the time. But since then, uh, you know, it's been years since then. And now you've been ministering all over the nations. Uh, you've been ministering uh, locally. You've written seven books. How do you write seven books, man? First off, <laughs> I, I guess one word at a time. No. <laughs> That's incredible, oh, man. man. Now, um, your story is incredible. Like the way God healed you and set you free and even encountered your life. Um, I think it's going to bless a lot of people today. But uh, for those that don't know Mike, he, he, um, he has a prophetic voice in this generation, and the Lord does speak to him powerfully. So right off the bat, I'd like to just uh, turn it over to you to say, what is the Lord speaking to you about this season? There's people literally globally watching this. So um, I know we're here in the United States, but it could be anybody watching right now. What does the Lord put on your heart? Yeah, I think in this season, not that this isn't relevant in every season, but in this season, the thing that is ultimate, the thing that is paramount is loving Jesus, washing our robes 
and readying our lives for the return of the Son of Man. Um, Revelation 19, 7 says we are headed towards the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I think as we survey the global landscape, we see the fulfillment of certain prophetic events in our lifetime that are historic in nature. They are unparalleled to any other generation that we've lived in. But it's not just the increase of you would, uh, the fulfillment of prophetic things. We also see the escalation of a demonic agenda. Uh, we see that very clearly throughout our nation specifically. There seems to be an onslaught or a tidal wave, an increase, the escalation of a demonic agenda seeking the fulfillment of the enemy's desires in our nation. Um, we understand towards the end of the age, which what we would call the climax of time or the consummation of the age when Jesus returns, which is our hope, even though you don't hear a lot about it anymore. Um, Jesus is coming again. The Son of Man will return on the clouds. He will come with his angels in the glory and authority of his Father, and he will come to reward and recompense men that have lived for him, loved him, and honored him with their whole life. But what we also understand is that though towards the end of the age there'll be the escalation of darkness, the enemy understands he's running out of time. He can't derail the purposes of God. He can't change what God has purposed to do in the earth. But what he can do is try to bring people with him towards that final moment of judgment that him and all of these divine rebels are going to incur whenever they stand before the Lord when the Son of Man returns. Um, his kingdom will be unending. Dominion has been given to him and the right to judge all of the tyranny of the wicked beasts, powers and principalities, the rulers of the age. So we understand towards the end of time as we know it, we're going to enter into forever with Jesus. Time will be abolished because death will be abolished. It will no longer be a final enemy, but towards the moment where time climaxes, the enemy's desires are going to be increased. There'll be a greater hostility in the earth. There'll be darkness that gets released, unprecedented to things that we've seen in previous generations. And we're seeing that right now, just in our, in our nation alone. Uh, we could go through a long list of things. America is hemorrhaging right now, but it's hemorrhaging according to demonic desire. But the focus is not the darkness. It's not the escalation of demonic desire, because what we're also going to see is the radical increase of the glory of God. God is with us. We are a people possessed by his spirit. Bro, there's going to be signs, wonders, miracles. I think that we are living in one of the greatest windows of history that the world has ever known. We will look back upon the intercession of the saints. We will look back upon the power of God on display. We will look back upon a beautiful people that will emerge throughout the nations that will glorify God and the demonstration of his kingdom will be unparalleled towards any generation that we've ever seen. But I believe that we are also, uh, and this sounds a little silly to say it this way, but potentially a little closer towards the return of the Son of Man than we may be, you know, willing to understand. Um, so I feel like the Lord is readying his people. Um, his desire, God is a family man, right? Daniel 7, 14, Revelation 5, 9, Revelation 7, 9, a people from every tribe, nation, and tongue, beholding the Lamb and adoring him forever. A bride for the son that he loves. Um, so the Lord is readying this bride. No spot, wrinkle, or blemish. God is doing it. It seems like an impossible task, but he's committed to it. He's given his life to it. Come on. And we have his spirit, and he's working it out in the nations right now. Yeah. No matter how impossible that may seem right now as we survey the global landscape, um, I honestly believe that the Lord is readying this bride, this church. That's so good. You know, God has a plan for every single person, but oftentimes we don't think of every single city, every single yeah. nation, you know, uh, continents. He has plans for it. The enemy does too, though. He has plans and he's yeah. marching yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's trying to get his agenda uh, accomplished as well. Yeah. And so there is that opposition there. But those of us that have found Christ have found the Trump uh, uh, a card in the situation. The blood of Jesus is upon us. Um, I grew up playing uh, uh, playing uh, the game of spades. It's a card game, oh, and so yeah. the 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 spades were the Trump. And 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 I remember like every time you had that ace of spades, you're like, bam! It's like God always has the ace up the sleeve, so to speak, and yeah. He takes care of the situation. I love it, and and He's doing it. He's accomplishing it. Um, and and my friends, uh, today He wants to encounter your life. Uh, the enemy has plans for you today, but today Jesus wants to set you free from that. Yeah. Now now, Mike, you were set free radically, but it wasn't for a few years. Uh, talk to me about your childhood, man. You're, you're 12 years old 
and you're exposed to just about everything. Yeah, I didn't grow up in, let's say, a Christian family, even in a religious household. My mom held a form of Catholicism, but man, over the history of my life, I can remember in my upbringing, maybe one or two Ash Wednesday services, no knowledge of God, no ways of righteousness, no children's church, youth group, no Christian friends, no, no praying before meals, no attending meetings, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, a godless environment, if I could say. Um, addiction, adultery, all types of crazy stuff in my home life. Violence in my house. We weren't connected with anybody else. Um, so I, I just thought my family was like every other family. I can't remember times where we would share meals with others or interact at the park or movies. Like nothing, nothing at all. So this type of environment in my upbringing led me to being exposed to a lot of things at an incredibly early age that I probably should have never been exposed to. Um, you know, my dad was in the military, so we traveled the world, you know, traveling every handful of years. So that aided in the disconnect that we had with people in general. Um, but you're right, man, by the age of like 11, 12, 12 for sure, um, already in sexual lifestyle, already experimenting with drugs and alcohol and things of that nature. Uh, and it just began to cultivate a very broken and dark way of living. You know, the lie is in moments like that, do what satisfies you, right? That's the lore. This feels good, man. It sounds good. Um, you know, pursue you. Uh, in those days, even from an early age, man, I became a prisoner. Uh, I was a captive to my own satisfactions. Um, I couldn't, I didn't have the power to do anything else other than what I thought felt good. What I wanted, who I wanted to do it with, the crowd I wanted to be around. Um, and man, honestly, it got me in a whole lot of trouble. Um, I ended up running with the wrong crowd, involved in gang type life, drug dealing, drug addicted. Um, later in life, got thrown out of high school, in and out of jail 15 times. Um, but yeah, and, and then also sitting in a doctor's office at 17. Um, after sleeping with who knows how many girls, how many females, uh, woke up one morning with an issue, tried to go to the restroom, knew I had problems. It's like, whoa, mayday, mayday. In case of emergency, break glass. I wasn't living with my parents at the time. Called my mom. I'm 17 years old. I had lived in my car for two years, just crazy stuff. Um, called my mom. I'm like, hey, we got to go to the doctor. She's like, oh, you know, I'll try to get you an appointment maybe next week, the week after. I said, oh, whoa, whoa. no, we're going today, like, or I'm going to an ER somewhere. And so by the end of the day, by the end of the day, after blood testing and physical examinations and things of that nature, um, sat across the desk, and I don't say this in a critical way, sat across the desk from a practicing professional. I mean, after all, it's called medical practice. Um, and had an older gentleman look at me in my face and say, son, because of the way you've chosen to live your life, because of the decisions you've made, you now have a disease that is ravaging your bloodstream. He said it's a transmitted disease through sexual activity, an STD, a sexually transmitted disease. Um, he said, but science has no hope for you. There's no cure. Um, he said, this is, as a matter of fact, it's gonna be a forever part of your story. You're gonna be branded for the rest of your life. Um, if you ever have a wife and you're ever intimate with your spouse, there's a 100% guarantee that you're gonna transfer this disease to your spouse. He's like, there's no way for you to have kids in a natural fashion. And even with some of the scientific breakthroughs, there's no guarantee that you'll ever be able to have kids without them being, and as he told me that day, quote unquote, tainted by my life's decisions. Um, he said, what I'm telling you is, is you have a disease and it's gonna now be a part of your family line forever. Um, you know, that day I found out that I had herpes. Um, you know, and you, you would think at 17 that this would have been the moment. Like, hey, listen, man, whatever you've been doing, it's not working. You know, like, like look in the mirror, yeah. man. Look in the like, mirror. <laughs> like you're the problem. You know, but for me, everybody else was the problem. It was my environment. It was, you know, what was going on with my my parents. You know, they got divorced, broken home, kicked out of school. It was all the cops that didn't like me. It was this. It was that. Um, and you would think that this would have been like the final, you know, nail in the coffin to be like, hey, listen, man, wake up. Like you're ruining your hope of a future. 
you're ruining any promise of you being able to fulfill something of destiny or, you know, creating a vision for the, what's going to, your life is going to look like later on. Um, you know, for me, man, at 17, there were a few things that I knew for sure. Uh, I was either going to die in a jail cell somewhere. I was going to die out on the streets because of the way I was living. Um, again, wrong crowd, wrong type of life, bad activities. Um, or over time, this disease was going to run its course um, and I was going to end up dying. And your, your life was in a prison cell. Like you just. I frequented them. Yeah. You know, so ra rather than this being the thing that woke me up, it, it's, it pains me to, to even recall this. Things got way worse. They got way darker. They got way more violent. I, I became way more intentional with darkness and violence. No, was there anything in your heart at that time that made you want to turn to Christ? You'd grown up with some, you know, Catholic backgrounds. You'd been around religion. I mean, was that even a, in your mind at all or was it just nothing? That's an amazing question, man. I, I can recall leading up to the moment where I actually saw the Lord, got born again, encountered Jesus for myself. Um, it was months and months and months. I remember uh, 2001, I went to jail five times. Um, in December, I ended up standing in a courtroom. A public defender intervened for me. I was supposed to go to state prison for a, a longer period of time. Last moment, public defender intervened. I ended up leaving with probation, all kinds of crazy stuff. But I remember after that thinking to myself, you have to do something different. I tried to join the military, went and took the ASVAP test. They're like, man, you're brilliant. You can do anything you want to do. You're just an idiot. Like you've gotten in way too much trouble. Like we can't take you. Um, but at this point, it put me kind of like on a track of thinking to myself, I don't know how to do anything different. And I can recall, man, months and months and months leading up to that born again moment um, where the partying would be over, the crowds would be gone, the club would be closed, all of the extracurricular activities would be done. Um, just walking the street at night by myself, looking up into the sky, bro, I mean, blasted out of my mind, drunk, high, on all kinds of other, you know, whatever, drugs and whatnot, tears running down my face, just several moments, man, looking up into the sky and saying things out, out in the middle of the road, in the middle of nowhere, screaming at the, at the sky. I don't know if you or who or what is even out there. I've heard about you but I don't, I don't know you and I don't even know if you're real. But if, if you are not real, then I have no hope. Wow. I said, because I, I want to be different. Wow. I just don't know how. Like, you know, I, I realized that, that I wanted to change. Like something in me didn't want to keep doing what I was doing. It didn't want to be like the only thing I knew to be. So although there was the recognition of like a desire to change, th there was equally the recognition of understanding that I had been rendered powerless. I would say, I, I don't know how to do anything else. Wow. Like if you're not real, I'm going to die being what I am. I, I can't do anything else. Did you even, in this understanding that if he was real, did you even know that he was a way? Like, was that even? No clue whatsoever, man. It, it was kind of like, a, like this is my last shot. You know, this is the last ditch effort. Like if, if you're not real, and, and maybe I, I believe, obviously the Lord put the, the desire in my heart. Um, because what I realized is when I first saw him and I turned my face to him for the very first time, um, I understood that he had been looking at me my whole life, even though I had been running from him even though I had never believed that he actually was real, even though I thought that because of the way I was and how I had been raised and the dark hole that I was living in, that he wouldn't want anything to do with me because of the condition of my life. Um, what I understood in that born again moment was he had been chasing me my whole life and I had been running from him. Um, so take me to that moment. You know, uh, it, it had been several months. So now it's two weeks past my 21st birthday. I am standing at an altar at a church, not because I'm trying to find Jesus in a church, 
not because I'm trying to integrate Christians in my life, hoping that they'll rub off on me and I can become a better person, not even thinking that church is the place to go in order to find the, the breakthrough or the solutions that I'm searching for in life. Um, I went to church that night uh, to fight a pastor's son. <laughs> Had two friends with me, backpack full of drugs. Long story short, we're waiting through service so that we can fight in the parking lot and then get back on to life as we knew it to be. I had plans. Again, I had a backpack full of drugs with me on the pew. Two friends, we're trying to fight after church, and I'm waiting. A lady asked me, um, can I pray for you? This is the close of service. Uh, can I pray for you? In my mind, I'm thinking to myself, I will do whatever I have to do to get out of this crazy place. I had never seen anything like it, bro. This was Ringling Brothers Circus to me. Full on charismania, bro. No grid for like Pentecost, no grid for charismatic, no grid for like Holy Ghost outpouring, no grid whatsoever, no frame. I have no idea what's going on. Um, there's a young guy on the platform that had just gotten out of Brownsville, leading worship, um, who you and I both know. Um, and I remember at the close of the service, he called everybody down front. Bro, people are jumping, crying, falling down, screaming. Singing this song set me on fire. And I was like, bro, I thought I had seen some wild stuff out in the streets. Like, <laughs> I never seen like what was going on. And this lady was like, can I pray for you? And again, whatever I got to do to get up out of here, man, I'm just trying to fight. I'm trying to get back onto life. Like I got stuff I got to do. I'm like, okay, sure, you can pray for me. I end up down at the altar, summarizing. The pastor says, um, son, do you want to get saved tonight? I was like, get saved from what? <laughs> he was like, no, really, do you want to get saved? And I was like, I, I don't understand what you mean. Like, get saved, I, I don't know what that means. He's like, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? I was like, oh man, that's way worse than the first question. I said, ask some dude into my heart. I said, bro, I ain't got no idea what you're talking about. I said, man, ask me something I can understand and maybe we can get somewhere. So he says, how about this? Would you be willing tonight to lay your life down and to no longer live it for yourself? But from this moment forward, would you be willing to live for God and for him alone? I was like, oh yeah, I ain't never done that. I was like, sure, if you want to do that, we could do that. He's like, you're going to do that? I was like, Man, listen, again, bro, whatever I got to do to get up out of here, bro, I'll do anything. You know what I'm saying? You want me to do some, like, jumping jacks, like, bro, whatever. And he's like, lift your hands. And so, bro, I lifted my hands, and I started to pray. And I always joke and say I made the mistake of praying. But I had been praying for months. I just didn't know it. And in that moment, man, when I lifted my hands and I began to pray, I saw him. And I came into a visionary encounter, and there he was. And man, he was, he was afar off, but when he saw me, he came running in my direction. And he grabbed me, man, and he held me close, and he just began weeping with me and speaking things over my life. And uh, bro, it, it seemed like four or five seconds coming out of the encounter, man, it had been like 45 minutes, and I was a radically different person. Um, instantly delivered drug addiction, alcoholism, rage, brokenness, lustful perversion, um, j just the years of bondage that I had been tracking in, instantly a different person. Uh, now I had to learn how to live that out. Um, being set free and learning how to consistently live in freedom are two different things. <laughs> uh, they're not the same. Uh, you have to learn how to live delivered, even though the Lord can deliver you in a moment. Um, I was a radically different person, but I was still sick. And I told Jesus, I'll give you the rest of my life. I'll give you everything I have, even if I have to live the rest of my life being sick. Because I didn't know that you could be healed. Three months later, I go to the same altar after a service and respond to an altar call for miracles. I'm afraid to tell anybody what I'm going through. I'm standing there shaking hard. My chest is beating, feels like my heart is going to come flying out of my chest. There was so much shame. There was so much guilt. I felt so unclean, right? Almost like the woman with the issue of blood. You don't belong here. Unclean, unclean. Jesus tells her, you're not only healed, but be set free from your suffering. Your faith has made you whole. 
but be set free from your suffering. Man, the suffering of the soul because of the condition that I had had for five, almost six years. But man, when they prayed for me, it felt like a hot bucket of water or oil got dumped on my head. And I felt it run down over my body. And I went home to take my pills. And as I extended my hand into the drawer, because I had been on medication now for almost five, six years. I want to say an audible voice. I heard it audibly. As I reached for my pills, the voice said, you don't need those anymore. Come on. <laughs> and I like to say it this way. The blood of Jesus gave me an answer that science hasn't found, that doctors haven't yet discovered, that money can't buy, that pills have not been able to fix. They don't know why I don't have herpes anymore. They don't know why my wife doesn't have herpes. They don't know why my four children and the one we're waiting for are all whole and perfect and beautiful. Um, when the doctor told me that this is going to brand you and it's going to forever be a part of your story, bro, we are branded by the Holy Ghost. We have been set free by the power of his blood. And I just believe that there's still power, power, wonder working power um, in the blood of the Lamb. Come on, friends, today, if you've heard this story from Michael, man, this is, this. if this doesn't get you out of your seat on that couch right now and get you <laughs> fired up, man, this, I don't know what will, because this is what Jesus does. 2,000 years ago, friends, he came to this earth, was born of a virgin named Mary. He lived a perfect life, uh, faced the temptations and the sins that we did, and he didn't fail. He lived a perfect life. He overcame them. He overcame and uh, the, the religious folk of the day. They, they, uh, they handed him over to be crucified upon a cross. My friends, he died upon that cross, but three days later, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He rose up from the grave, and now he is alive forevermore. And my my friends, the Bible says that if you will just simply call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. It is that simple. And today I want to give you that opportunity. Just pray right where you are. Uh, no matter if you're in a car or, or driving along the side of the road somewhere, if you're, uh, if you're at your market or if you're uh, there in your home right now, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Set me free. Break every chain of death every chain of sickness, every chain of uh, illness that is upon my life, set me free. I plead for the blood of Jesus to cover me as it did, Mike. I pray that you would come into my life, that from this moment forward, I would live my life fully surrendered to you. God, I don't want to do it my way. I want to do it your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. You can see that number there on the screen, and I encourage you to call it and uh, to report, uh, to let people know that you've just given your life to Christ. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation on the Awaken the Wonder podcast for part two. Michael, where can people follow you? Uh, anywhere, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, just search Burning Ones. We're on all those platforms. Yep. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Until next time. Hey, everybody. My brand new book, Hunger, is now out. Just head over to Amazon to get the hard copy or the ebook, or you can visit Audible to get the audiobook. Get your copy today.